the history of the Planet of the Apes begins with Mr. Monsieur Pierre Boulle, who in 1963 publishes Planet of the Apes, or as its title is in French, Monkey Planet. <laughs> uh, <laughs> this was his only work of science fiction. His other best known work is Bridge on the River Kwai, oh, yeah. which was adapted into an amazing movie. The screenwriter for both of those movies is the same man, Michael Wilson, who uh, also wrote the 1968 Planet of the Apes. Uh, has anybody here read Planet of the Apes, the novel? Matt is only asking this question so that he can raise his... I have not, but I want to. I've been thinking about it. I I, can only, I think I only recently found out it was based on a book. I really forgot about it for a while. But um, yeah, I'll have to... Uh, it's only one book, right? I'll have to look look for it sometime. Yeah. Try to listen it's to it. It's pretty short. I read it all yesterday. <laughs> it's, uh, and it's very... It's fascinating. It's all... It's like... It's fascinating to read a novel of a movie you've seen a million times and it's like you're, you're entering sort of a parallel world where you're like, I know that character, but that's not what they say. Hey, that's not what he say. No, but but um, the, the, the ways that I'm sorry, I'm swatting a fly. <laughs> okay. I'm not trying to get your Let's attention. High five. Yeah. Um, the, the book basically opens <laughs> in the distant future and you have space travelers named Jin and Phyllis. They're on a space cruise and they find a floating bottle in space. And so they get it. And inside the bottle is a manuscript. And it's the story of a man named Ulis. And he recounts his story of stumbling upon the planet of the apes. So the rest of the book is just your reading what they're reading in the bottle. And it's his story of going to the planet of the apes. He's been, he's Charlton Heston from the, from the first movie, basically a uh, few differences are the uh, apes don't speak English. Like they can't actually communicate with okay. him. Um, and, and they're also more technologically advanced. And both of those things make more sense to me, but but I I think it would have made the movie less engaging and le- like kind of the movie wanted you to just skip right to like the fact that a religion formed around this that that it's that it's a primate made religion that like we, we if we had to do it over again and we always do have to do it over and over again we will make the same mistakes and use the same things to control and we will get things a little bit better but then make problems where we didn't know there could be it's parenting fucking we're all gonna tell the same lies right <laughs> um the, um yeah, but the English part was uh, as soon as we started watching the 1968 version. I'm like, oh come on, they speak English. This and, is stupid. And but- it's like he does eventually learn to communicate. Like they learn each other's languages. It's right. like the movie Arrival. But I get that when you're making the movie, you're like, we need to just skip to the part where they can understand each other. Right. Well, and um, I will say about the first one as well, the humans not being able to speak that are already on that planet makes way more sense. Thing. And that's that's also the case in the book. Okay, that just makes way. I mean, it, it is a we, uh, that's a a thing, a mistake. I think the remake does. I think so too. But okay, so the other. I mean, it makes sense, like, like, like uh, story wise. But why would it make sense logically? Why would they lose their knowledge of speech just by being subjugated? Like they can talk to, together if they're in prison or exactly. in camps or whatever, or living in huts. So why no? Why wouldn't they lose their speech though? It doesn't make sense that way true yeah but like in the remake they're they're not like the apes have no reason to consider them lesser beings other than prejudice and i think that the then it makes the the sort of metaphor it's like literally just racism an apartheid state that they're building and i think that's i think it's more interesting to think um about how like we treat animals and that's okay i mean that's okay they're racist yeah but like it's a different thing i don't i don't don't have a problem with the apes being uh Race, right? Yeah, th- they can be wrong for different. Yeah, I don't. I don't think that's a, a problem having these apes being. But I guess for the first one, what was like so, what was charming to me is that their whole thing was that they were trying to do it different, do it better, um, be better, and so you you have to automatically make a more cruel culture around the kind of ape that could be so heartless towards something that is communicating exactly what they need to you so it just it automatically makes the 2001 one lose that charm of these nicer nicer primates yeah the apes in the original are doing exactly what we do to animals exactly so it is it is support supposed to be holding up a mirror to you the audience yeah that makes sense i also i realized the 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 tim burton version I think is the, and I've watched a lot of apes movies recently. It's the only one where the apes are unquestionably the bad guys. That's, that's the other thing. That was a lot. Like, I like that the apes, I, I was on their side in the first one. 
And in in the Matt Reeves one, like you are one hundred percent on the ape side. Okay. They're the sympathetic side. Um, so that's that's interesting. But the okay, so the the reason I'm bringing up what happens in the book is because the 2001 version basically adapts the ending of the book. The ending of the book has the Charlton Heston character escape from the planet of the apes. The planet of the apes is not earth. And then he makes it back to the earth. He lands in Paris, his hometown of Paris, the Eiffel tower. But when he gets out of his spaceship, it's gorillas and as cops and stuff. It's, (laughs) it's basically the ending of this movie. Okay. And then it gets back to the framing story, the astronauts who are reading the message in the bottle. And then it reveals that these astronauts are also apes. And they're like talking humans. I don't believe it. That's interesting. So I do think it was, it's kind of a cool nod to the book for this movie to be more faithful to that, uh, to that twist ending. Mm -hmm. And also like, how do you recreate the most famous twist ending in movie history? Right. You just have to go somewhere completely different. Or Um, exactly the same. Yeah. The movie, the, the, the movie, a great movie. We've already talked about it. Directed by Franklin Schaffner starring Charlton Heston. It was a huge hit and spawned a franchise in many ways. It's like a forerunner of today's franchise driven films, except that, uh, each of these movies had a lower budget and was like treated less seriously, even though they made money. And they're they're really good. If you haven't seen them, they're all worth checking out. Uh, but back then, it was just like a sequel. Psh, that's cheap. That's a B movie. I will, though, give you my gripe of all 60s movies that they just can't seem to fathom a non-hot woman being in the fucking story. And there are two hot women who seem to have nothing to do uh, with anything brave or interesting or they're just there to mate with he literally says that even of the astronaut woman who's in in space with him who does not make it uh that she was gonna help populate the new world like fuck she's a scientist astronaut she was going to be our eve ew anyway but even the freaking wild thing girl is hot as shit like nova fuck off nova and then there was a TV show, short-lived TV show in the 70s. But basically, let's fast forward. It's the late 80s, okay? Okay. I'm going to credit the book Tales from Development Hell by David Hughes. You should check this book out if you like stories about movies that spend a lot of time with studios wondering what to do with and hiring different directors and, and writers and the many different iterations. And it has a whole chapter on the Tim Burton Planet of the Apes. And the way it starts is... Um, Adam Rifkin, who later directed movies like Detroit Rock City, had a sort of small indie movie called Never on Tuesday that was uh, got a lot of notice in 1989. And the president of Fox was a big fan of it. So he invited him, him in to the studio for a meeting and said, what would you like to do if you if you if, if you were working with us? What would you like to do? And he said, I love Planet of the Apes. I think that you, you own Planet of the Apes. You should make a direct sequel to the original film. And that kind of gets the ball rolling. Um, over the next decade of developing what for the most part is supposed to be a sequel kind of like what what movie what happens in franchises now where you just make a direct sequel to the original um and originally rifkin is involved but then it goes over to bigger directors like oliver stone and that eventually would have been interesting yeah eventually settles on director philip noyce who made the um noyce who made the uh, Harrison Ford, Jack Ryan movies. And the star attached was Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> and the script, everybody was saying, this is the best script I've ever read. It was called Return of, Return of the Apes. Again, it is a direct sequel to the original movie that's going to ignore Planet of the Apes 2 through 5. Okay. And again, you have Arnold Schwarzenegger, the biggest star in Hollywood at the time. Uh, but there's this great detail in the book um, where... There's an executive at Fox, and he has this idea he keeps bringing up. I'll read from the book. He said, quote, what if our main guy finds himself an ape land and the apes are trying to play a game like baseball, but they're missing one element, like the pitcher or something. And when I guy comes along, he knows what they're missing and he shows them and they all start playing, end quote. Okay, so he tells this to Arnold Schwarzenegger <laughs> and Philip Noyce, and they're like, um, okay. And, he's, and, and so they leave the meeting, and the script gets rewritten and delivered to the studio again. And the same guy's like, hey, where's the baseball? (laughs) And uh, they're like, what do you mean? He's like, doesn't have any baseball. So at this point, they lose (laughs) Arnold Schwarzenegger and Philip Noyce. And it's just, we've all had bosses like this. They're like, but if I don't have my own idea, what's the point of me if I can't put my own stink on it? I want apes playing baseball. So that's how they lose on Arnold Schwarzenegger. But what? 
primate of any kind would be playing a game without some sort of major part of it that makes it work at all. Who would, why would they be playing it? He's just the ideas guy. You figure that out. <laughs> Little writer man, you go figure this out. I just have these great big ideas. We really have had this boss many times. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, the, the project ends up getting offered to screenwriter William Broyles, who had written Apollo 13 and Castaway. And he said he had no interest in it, but the studio was like, please, uh, listen, how about this? You can do whatever you want with it. And he said he was looking up in the night sky and he thought, I guess I could like really make it my own. There's some stuff I could do. And he writes a draft that Tim Burton reads and apparently loves. And uh, Tim Burton at this point is spending a whole year in this famous story of him developing uh, Superman Lives, which was written by Kevin Smith. And Nicolas Cage is attached to play Superman. Oh, wow. This movie enters pre-production and it's a famous movie that totally falls apart. It sounds amazing, actually. Fucking Kevin Smith, Tim Burton and Nicolas Cage. Sign me up. And uh, so Tim Burton has nothing to do. So they offer him Planet of the Apes. And he's like, yeah, okay, shrug. I'll do it. Here's what he said. He said, I quote, I wasn't interested in doing a remake or a sequel of the original Planet of the Apes. But I was intrigued by the idea of revisiting the world. Like a lot of people, I was affected by the original. It's like a myth or a fairy tale that stays with you. The idea of reimagining that mythology was very exciting to me. End quote. And the the thing they kept saying is, this isn't a remake, it's a reimagining. Is it? Mm-hmm. No, it's not, my man. It is. No. Ball. Oh, barely. We... barely. It is. Look. D- this... Fucking barely. All those differences you're talking about, that's me. the reimagining part of it. Well, Joshua, Fine. like, Tim Burton is very distinctive uh, style and vision, and he has his things that recur throughout his movie. Like Melissa Glassbottom. Like striped. Uh, What's her name? What like Helena Bonham Carter? That's what I said. Okay, but like this feels like the least <laughs> personal of all of his movies. Like, <laughs> I knew Josh. Yeah. Like, yeah. Um. Do you do you see much Tim Burton in this movie? More the designs of of the of the you know the the technical aspects of it, like the costumes, the hats, the swirls, there's shapes, there's things like that. Um. He's got some of his actors in there also. Mm-hmm. Um. Yeah, you know, I was I was I would say it's a Tim Burton movie. I don't think it's a void of his touch. You know what? I didn't even think about that, Joshua. But you're right. The those hats are so extra. Um, the they're they, they very much Wizard of Oz vibes. Um, right. It maybe also it's like whimsy in the way that he decided to let them move just like apes like the way that the huge jumps and the climbing the randomly climbing up shit and just swinging from something for no reason it just it is kind of his playful kid like Mm -hmm. framing of stuff it's 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 what a kid would do if they were a monkey adult and i think that i think that all the like ape society stuff like the dinner party yeah just like looks at like there's you see have like the have the heavy metal apes and you have the ape and his wife were like going to get down to some ape s and some s S and ape uh i think i think that that's the stuff that probably attracted him to it but then you kind of get away from all that and it just becomes an action movie for that's the the worst part of it though yep (laughs) oh wait what part what part's the worst part i think all those stupid little um the way that they're like humans i think it's it's so cheesy i think that's the part that doesn't work at all for me Oh, I like that stuff. The, the foreplay, the eight good, foreplay. I, like I, think, I think it's. I think it makes it too silly. It, it makes it more yeah. fun, I guess. But I think it's too silly. No, and I have that same note. I've like, I don't need an exact replica of human street punk kids wearing leather jackets and smoking from a bong. That is so stupid. So that's what I mean by like. I guess you're reimagining it, but you're just putting way too many human qualities into this world and leaving out a whole bunch of other random ones, and the. Maybe we're not here yet for this complaint. No, go ahead. But the variety of of ape, I, I understand humans have variety, but we don't have a variety in the people we choose to serve at the very top of our military. Those are some of the most buttoned up, prestigious, straightforward white men you're ever going to see. They're not 
like the most extra fucking evil ape I've ever seen in my life. How the hell would he be the head of the military? You're talking about General Thane. He's out of his fucking mind. He I, doesn't make yeah. sense. Thane. Lacey, I think yeah. that you you do you are not giving credit to all the great military <laughs> weirdos of human history. <laughs> I mean, come on. Tim Roth is General just... MacArthur. Ugh. I mean, <laughs> shut up. We'll talk more about. We'll talk more about General Thade. Okay, let's um, get there. Just a little. Just a little bit more. Uh, th- this movie, uh, as we said, had an extremely rushed out. production schedule, and um, they made it work. And this movie actually was a big hit. Okay, but it is the rare movie that was a big hit that they never considered making a sequel to. Burton is quoted as saying, they, they asked him, Burton, if he would like to direct a sequel. He said, I'd rather jump out of a window. <laughs> um, and then the movie was called Rise of the Apes until shortly before it was going to be released when they just renamed it to Planet mm. of the Apes. Right. Oh. Uh, we'll briefly talk about Mark Wahlberg. He had Boogie Nights come out in 97. That made people start taking him seriously as an actor. He's coming off of Three Kings and The Perfect Storm. Basically, Perfect movies for him. The project of making him a major movie star is well underway. But this movie's kind of a blip because I don't think most people liked him in it. Mm-hmm. And uh, 2011, when Rise of the Planet of the Apes was coming out, um, Wahlberg was asked about it. And he said, quote, I haven't seen it yet, but I heard it was pretty damn good. Well, ours wasn't. <laughs> it is what it is. Ours wasn't. They didn't have the script right. They had a release date before they had shot a sh- a foot of film. They were pushing Tim and pushing him in the wrong direction. You have to let Tim do his thing. Right. Uh, he said, I have no better time on any movie than I had working with Tim. Aww. I had the most amazing time with Tim. Aww. And then, then the most Mark Wahlberg quote ever, when we were doing reshoots, he came out with me to Paris. We're in the club. I'm sorry. I need to do the Wahlberg voice. You do the voice. We're in the club. Tim was in the club, man. Tim was in the club. Then he'd be drawing people and all his characters look the same. He'd be drawing people in the club. The Celtics. Um, oh my God. <laughs> okay. And then, yeah, got rebooted again. Much more serious minded. But uh, he, he did that one for like Tim, by the this way. This current series of movies. He did what? I'm saying like, like he actually didn't read the script. He, he signed on before there was a script and he did it for to work with Tim Burton. Oh. Like, he really wanted to work yeah, with Yeah, I saw that too. That's cool. He would yeah, do, like, he said, he right. said, yeah, he did say like, uh, it was just just wanted to work with you i don't it doesn't even matter what it is i just want to work with you he's you know at the top of his tim burton in the 90s was like at the top of his power um okay well now one hour in we can start talking about the movie (laughs) shit